Welcome to a look at the Quacks of Quedlinburg from North Star Games. Quacks of Quedlinburg was designed by Wolfgang Warsh, one of the hottest new designers in the board game world, who just kind of came out of nowhere in the last few years and has a number of hits under his belt already. It features artwork and design by Warsh himself, along with Dennis Bahausen. It was published in North America by North Star Games, and that's the copy I happen to own myself. Now, a copy of Quacks of Quedlinburg plays two to four players, taking under an hour for most games. This push your luck dice based dice base. Whoa. Ah. This push your luck bag builder has an MSRP of a very reasonable $39.99 US dollars. And this is the Bellhop's personal copy of the game. Nothing was provided. Now, Quacks of Quedlinburg has racked up its fair share of accolades, including Origins Best Family Game. UK Games Expo, People's Choice, the Meeple's Choice Award, the Golden Geek Best Family Game, and most important to hobby board gamers, the actual Kenner Spiel de Jar, the year it came out, as well as many more. Now, this is one we've been seeing people play on streams and talking about for far too long before we got it to the table ourselves. I actually got to see it played in person even a number of times, but it was always at events where I was teaching something else usually Terraforming Mars at around that time. One of the local gamers had a copy and I just never got to sit in on it. Now in a game of the Quacks of Quedlinburg, players take on the role of a quack doctor in a medieval setting, each competing to be the most successful charlatan. They do this by brewing up bubbly potions by adding ingredients to each their own individual pots, trying to get the thickest and most volatile mixture without going too far and causing their pot to explode. At the end of each round, players score points and get currency to spend to buy new ingredients, each of which does something different when added to your pot. Multiple recipe books are included, which provide four different mechanics for each of the variable ingredients, making it so you pretty much never have to play the exact same game twice. For a look at the components in this Push Your Luck Bag Builder, be sure to check out our Quacks of Quedlinburg unboxing video on YouTube. Just a few things I want to note here. Uh, the rules are excellent, very succinct, well-written, only eight pages, which is impressive. And they also provide you a nice QR code so you can watch fine Canadian Mr. Rodney Smith tell you how to play the game. Along with these rules, you also get what's called the Almanac of Ingredients. And this explains what each of the different variations of each ingredient does. These match the recipe cards, but feature a lot more detail. So you just have icons on the cards, full text on the book. Um, you also, there, there's a, a a uh, ton of punch boards in the box as well that give you all kinds of things. You got scoring tracks, player boards, flasks that are two-sided, fill or empty, the recipe cards themselves, and lots and lots of small ingredient chips. All of these were well cut, a pleasure to punch, no issues, nothing peeled. I didn't have any problems with them. Now, the game does have a serviceable two-trough insert that's covered in thematic artwork. In that, you're going to find four silky bags. Uh, wooden player tokens for each character or each player, custom etched six sided die that has unique symbols on it, a deck of fortune cards. Those I, I, they're everywhere now. Those little plastic gems that are kind of misshapen that people use in all kinds of crafts uh, that remind me of Ascension whenever I see them, and a nice selection of baggies to organize all this stuff. Overall, the quality here is great. The artwork is fantastic, as is the graphic design. Mm -hmm. While there is a lot of iconography, all of it is very easy to understand and clear, and there's always the almanac of ingredients you can reference if there is something that isn't clear. Now, with that overview of what you get in the box, let's talk, box, let's talk about how you play the game, the Quacks of Quedlinburg. All right, you start off with a couple decisions. One of them is to decide which side of the player boards to use. Front side is just like normal game, your, your expected game, and then the second side actually has a bunch of potions on the bottom of it, or vials with different colors on them. That's the more complicated rule. So I suggest starting off with the main side for your first few games. So the game has some great variation in it, like with these player boards. So you can really vary difficulty and increase your replayability. Very true. Next up, you have to decide what ingredients you'll use. Now, every ingredient is used every game, at least in the base game. Note, I have not played the expansion. We're just looking at the base game. Many of the ingredients feature four different variations to choose from. And each of these is represented by a rep, uh, recipe tile. Well, technically, there's two and they're two-sided. And you just look at the number of the bookmark on it to show which one it is. 
Now, what the game does recommend is start with all of the level one ones or all the ones with one bookmark. And I got to say, I concur with this. This is one tricky aspect of the game as it's easy to get used to an ingredient doing one thing and perhaps even forget that you changed from last game what the infect effects of the ingredient are. Yeah, very true. If you're playing two games in a row, make sure everyone's well aware of what ingredients you're using. And if someone's joining your game who has played, say, oh, I played it once before, make sure they're aware of what ingredients are. Now, once you got these picked out, you're just going to collect your stuff, right? You're going to take your player board, put it on the right side. You're going to place your tokens in the respective spots in your flask. I'm not going to get into the details for this. You don't really need to know that. Everyone does start with one ruby, and you're going to put your thickness token. It looks like a little water drop right in the center of your pot in the first space. And note, that's T-H-I-C-K, not T-H-I-C-C. Sorry if we got your hopes up. There's probably a game out there with a thick token, but that's not what we're talking about here. Now, players each take a bag and you're going to fill it with starting ingredients. I'll get into what these all are later, but you're going to put in one white level one, two white level twos, one white level three, one orange, and one level one green. More about exactly what those do later. Now, all of the ingredient chits are then sorted and placed near their recipe cards. Now, most ingredients come in three levels, one, two, and four. And this indicates when you're pulling them and putting in your pot, how many gaps you leave on your board which ends up meaning that higher level ingredients lead to higher scoring pots, potion pots. Now, this number can also change what the ability for the ingredients do, but that completely decides on which recipe you decide to use. Now, at the start of the game, you're gonna pull the yellow and purple ingredients kind of off to the side because you can't purchase them. They're added later in the game. And that's really all there is to set up. Now, once you have everything set up, play simultaneous. Everyone plays at once. You're gonna play over nine rounds. Now, at the start of every round, the active player, which passes at the end of every round, clockwise, is going to draw a card from the fortune teller deck and read it out, and you're going to act on what the card says. Now, these cards are about 50-50 split on stuff that happens immediately or effects that stay in place and affect the round. Now, these encode all kinds of things I'm not going to give in detail to, like giving players a chance to increase the thickness of their pot or giving free ingredients or changing the odds pots will explode and so on. Uh, sorry, I haven't seen them by all by any means, but they are often quite welcome. Next, all players brew their potions. You do this by pulling chips out of your bag one at a time and adding them to your player board, starting with the spot next to your thickness token. The number on the chip indicates how far away from that token or the last ingredient you placed it goes. So like a level one chip just goes in the next empty spot, whereas a level two chip would skip over one and a level four would skip over three. Now, after placing the chip, you do the effects that chip has. Again, these are listed on the recipe cards. At any point, you can just choose to stop drawing chips. You indicate this by putting your bag on the table and saying you're done, and now you get to watch other people stress out over if they should be pulling or not. Now, stopping can be important because if you ever end up with a total number of white chips, cherry bombs, that their levels total seven, more than seven together, your pot explodes. Now, luckily, you should know exactly what's in your bag, so it's not too hard to figure out the odds with each pull from the bag. Especially at the beginning of the game. Once you get a pretty full bag, it does get more difficult. Now, at any point when drawing a chip, as long as your pot doesn't explode with that chip, you have the option to use your flask and return that chip to the bag. You just flip it over to the empty side, and you can't use it again until you refill it. So one redo, so long as you didn't blow things up. Now, once all players are done, they're all done brewing, they've either blown up or they put their bag down, well, you probably put your bag down either way, you enter the evaluation phase. First, you figure out who has the thickest, most impressive brew that didn't explode. This player, or players if tied, get to roll the special D6 die and gets a benefit. Now, these include getting to thicken your pot, getting some points, getting a free pumpkin ingredient, or gaining a ruby. Now, a couple times now I mentioned thicken your pot. What that does is that water drop you place in the center starts spinning out, it starts moving away from the middle, which leads to starting the game or starting the round further up on the track for all future rounds. And since the goal, of course, is to get the furthest on your track, the thickest potion, the further along you start, the less pulls you need and the better your odds. Exactly. Next, you're gonna look and see if anyone has any black ingredients in their pot and resolve them, then green, then resolve them, and purple, then resolve them. Again, you're gonna use the recipe cards as a reference. 
Now, this could lead to players moving things in their pot, scoring points, or getting to thicken their pots based on which ingredients you have in play. Next, you're going to look at the spot just after your last ingredient, so the, the first empty spot. And if it shows a ruby, you get a ruby. You also then get the points that are shown on that spot, which is tracked on the scoreboard. Then there's one other number on there. That's the amount of gold coins you earn selling your potion that round. You then use that to spend on ingredients. You can buy one or two ingredients, but they have to be different types. Now, the cost of each ingredients on the recipe cards, and one thing that's important is gold does not carry over. There's nothing you actually have to track here. So if you don't spend all your gold right now, it's lost. And now that's if you didn't explode your pot, but this game is quite friendly. So even if your pot blew up, you're not completely out of luck. Right. So if your pot explodes, you did have to stop. So you're stuck wherever you just ended. You're not eligible for that bonus die, but you still get to either score points or go shopping. And honestly, it's really not that bad. It's not that harsh because early in the game, there's very little points. Like you have to go pretty thick before you get into a lot of points. So you're probably just going to be like, I don't need the points. I'm going to go shopping. Whereas later in the game, you probably got plenty of chips in your bag. And you know what? Getting those points might be worth it. Now, finally, the last thing you do at the end of every round is players have the option to spend two rubies if they have them to either thicken their pot, as we talked about before, or flip their fat flask back to the full side, assuming they've used it. Now, there are some variations that happen while you're playing. Starting with the second round, the rat tails come into play. This is a catch-up mechanic where every player compares their spot on the score track to the leader and counts up how many rat tails are shown in graphics on the board um, that they have. And then they have the option to add these tails to their pot to artificially thicken them. This is represented by placing the rat token on your board a number of spaces ahead your thickness token equal to the number of tails. Now, the rules say this is optional, but I still have not seen any reason why you wouldn't use your rat tails every round. So interestingly, there is a certain group of people who don't like this mechanic. I ran across this while I was researching something in the game at some point, and I was personally confused by it. But some people are competitive enough to not enjoy catch up mechanics personally i find that why is someone who's that competitive playing such a random game as this like you're playing quacks of quedlinburg it's kind of a silly game where potions explode and you're throwing interesting things in a pot but fair as some people don't want to use the rat mechanic it's a really simple one to skip i don't think it would ruin the game so i wouldn't want to be that player and last the whole game now during rounds two and three new ingredients get added remember i said you put some aside well in round two the yellow comes back and in round three the purple comes back Additionally, when you hit round six, the game gets a little more difficult because everyone has to add one more level one white token to the bag. Now, while most of the game is played, everyone playing at their own speed simultaneously, when you do get to the last round, that changes. This is still played simultaneously, but everyone draws just one chip, deals with it, then waits till everyone's done, then draws another chip and deals with it. To pass this time instead, when you're pulling your chips out of your bag, you reveal an empty hand, and that means you're done for the round. As in the normal game, while you are playing, you're supposed to be focused on your own pot, and the game strongly discourages you from looking at other players' pots to make your decision. You're just supposed to be focused on your pot. But that final round, like knowing how many black ingredients a player has or how much gold they're going to collect, or if you're in the lead for thickness, is an important part of the decision in the final round of the game. So it is played time-based in that last round. Uh, interestingly, everything in this game is simultaneous. Yeah. Uh, even uh, even re uh, resolving cards. The only time that things are not simultaneous is if player order will affect something. So if you're about to run out of rubies, yes. you have to take player order into account. But otherwise, everything throughout the game is simultaneously. Yes. Now, now in... Yeah, sorry. Honestly, what, most of the time, though, especially during those first rounds, you're so focused on remembering what's in your bag <laughs> and thinking about the odds and counts of what's in your bag and what you might be pulling next. The, uh, the, the, the thought of looking at someone else's pot, it just isn't there. Yeah. And plus, once you've passed, right, you're not allowed to pick your bag back up. So at that point, feel free to watch what other people are doing and see how much it's either ruining your plans or how you're still in the lead. Now, the final evaluation phase is in the ninth round. Instead of buying ingredients, because there's no point, right, you're done playing, your purchase power is then converted to points. Five purchase power to one point and you also sell all your rubies because there's no reason to thicken your pot or anything at this point and those are two to one so you spend two rubies to get one point 
At the end of that, player with the most points wins. Now, what I didn't talk about at all at this point is what all these ingredients are and what they do. So there are a total of eight ingredients, most of which have four different powers. So here's a quick list of what each of them do with at least one ability they have. So I'm going to start with orange, which is representative of pumpkins. They don't do anything. They fill your pots and they're cheap. You can only buy level one pumpkins. Next, one of my favorites is the blue, which is the crow skull. These include abilities that let you draw bonus ingredients and pick one to place and put the rest back in. Or there's ones that give you rubies if you place them on a, on a spot that shows a ruby on it. They do some really neat things. Next are red, which are toadstools. We tend to call them mushrooms, but close enough. Uh, they've got some neat ones that involve the pumpkins, like skip spots based on how many pumpkins are already in the pot. Or combining with the white chips to make them more potent. So the more white chips you have, the better your reds are. Yellow is the Mandrake. Their most powerful ability to me is the level one ability, which is to give you a chance to return white chips to your bag. But they can also increase your explosion threshold with a different recipe. Now, blacks represent African death head hawk moon moths. Um, this is an ability set by the number of players. So yes, there are two sides to this, but it's based on how many people are playing the game. And what this does is rewards the player who has the most black chips in their pot at the end of the round. They're going to earn rubies or get the chance to increase the thickness of their pots. And this one only comes in one level. You buy blacks. You can't buy level two or three, two or four blacks. Next are green, which are the garden spiders. They tend to reward you for being the last or second last ingredient in your pot, or perhaps letting you thicken your pot by spending rubies when placed. Now, purple is ghost breath. You get rewarded for having one, two, or three of them in your pot, or rewarding points for where in your pot they are. How thick was your pot before you added them, which I thought was a really fun one. Then finally, we have the whites, the cherry bombs. So these are the chips that make your pot explode. And I don't know if you remember from the beginning, it's also what you start with the most of. And yes, I know they don't look like cherries, but that's because this is a German game. And the picture is of the German snowberry or Nollerbsen, which is also the German word for bang snap. So what you have here is a really clever German pun that just didn't translate well. But if you want to, you can call them bang snaps. I think it fits a little better. I won't tell anyone. I don't know why they didn't just call them snowberries. Uh, too much Google is spent annually by players who buy this game and try to figure out this yeah. very issue. At some point, everyone who owns this game, if they haven't heard it already, is like, what are the, why are these white? Why are they called cherry bombs? Now, I did mention earlier, there's a second side to the player board. If you're using that, at the bottom, there's all these vials. You put a second thickness token down there, a liquid token down there. And every time you get to thicken your pot, you get a choice. Thicken your main pot or move this token to the right going across the various vials. And each of them shows some kind of reward. They do things like giving you free uh, ingredients or giving you points or rupees. Now that we know what you get and how to use it all, let's move on to our opinion of this game. Does Quacks of Quedlinburg live up to the hype and who should be looking to pick this game up? Yeah, speaking of this game had a lot of hype, a ton of hype since it was first published. This game was so popular that it, it did the wingspan thing. It did the, everyone's talking about it. It's out of print. No one can get it. People are paying ridiculous price on the secondary market and it comes back in print and everyone's been waiting for it, pre-orders it and it goes out of print again and then it comes back in print. And I honestly think right now it might be between printings. That's how popular this game is. There were times when you just couldn't get this game anywhere. And that's one of the main reasons it took me so long to actually get a copy myself, which my mom managed to track down and give me for my birthday this year. And I don't even know where she found it because I think she might have got it on some one, you know, on online game store and paid shipping to get it here. So thanks, mom. Now that I played the game multiple times, like I, at least three game nights where we played multiple times in a row, this is a great game. I, I will straight up say yes. The Quacks of Quedlinburg lives up to the hype. All of the hype I've read. Even right now, you can still find it on eBay for $150 in a new un yeah, un I said it's box. between printings again. Do not pay $150 for this game. It's good. Just wait for the next printing. Now, it was one of those games that everyone had talked about it so much. You started to question if it could yep. really be that good. Or maybe it was only for a certain group or a very narrow type of player. But no, it's really good. Oh, it is. It, it is really damn good. But I will say it's not perfect. 
I do have some minor complaints. Like my biggest minor complaint is still pretty minor. And that's the bag and the chips and how the two integrate. Like at first you see it, and you're like, oh, these tokens are nice and thick. And I, I can't tell them apart at all, which is important, right? I, I can't tell them apart. And it's a nice silky bag. My hand fits in it good. It's a decent sized bag. But then once you actually start to use it, this bag wants to be flat. And it, it's a flat style bag that's stitched on the edge and it has corners. And it's just not as easy as it should be to not get the chits to just like line up in a row in the bottom and you shake it up and they don't really feel like they're moving around enough. And like really to mix it up, you kind of have to get in there and do this, which I, I just want to shake the bag. Plus stuff gets stuck in the corners all the time. Like there's always at least one chip stuck in a corner that you totally didn't realize was in your bag. You go to clean up the game and you're like, oh, there's one more in here. Yeah, this is hands down my biggest complaint and not just mine. It's probably the biggest complaint you find on the game on the, yeah. the web about this game. And it's a very specific combination of bag and cardboard that caused the problem. Yeah. If the bag was a rounded bottom without corners, this would be a moot point. Yeah. If the tokens were notably thicker or better yet, the nice wooden pieces you can buy as upgrades, this wouldn't be an issue. But as it stands right out of the box, it is unfortunately less than ideal. Yep, totally agree. Now, the other issue that I don't have with the game, but other players have raised while playing this game, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is the very high random factor. While it's possible and encouraged for players to completely memorize what's in their bags and potentially what's in their opponent's bags and figure out the exact odds of pulling a specific tile and the exact odds of exploding by pulling the next tile, there's always a chance things don't play to the odds. There might be a 99% chance. Well, there's still that 1% chance. You, well, I don't think the odds that your bag never gets full enough to be a 99% chance. This can be very frustrating for highly strategic players. Players who want to win or lose a board game based on their own abilities and not the vagaries of a bag pull. Now attached to this, there is some additional randomness too with the bonus die and the fortune cards. If someone keeps rolling rubies or thicken their pot on that bonus die, that gives them a significant advantage. And some of the fortune cards do favor one player over another. As someone who plays a lot of random games, this is one I find that works. It's mm -hmm. not like if you reduce the randomness, you'd have a solid thinky game. Randomness is an integral part of the game. Yeah, it, it, by design, it's a push your luck game. That's the, the, the whole point of the game is how many can I pull before it pull, blows up? Do I make the pull or do I not? Now, there are some ways to mitigate this randomness a bit. Uh, tactical use of your flask, knowing when to use it, purchasing ingredients that do things to change the odds, right? To increase your explosion limit or put tokens back in your bag or select, draw a bunch of tokens and pick one are all going to help with that randomness. But you know what? Even with all of those in play, if you try to make it as little random as possible, it's still a push your luck game. And while it does feature some solid strategic elements, like what you buy, you can definitely go different strategies and you can plan ahead as far as what you're going to buy in the next games. And yes, it has a very Euro style system. It's a most points win game, but luck plays a big part of the Quacks of Quen Limber. The push your luck just can't be completely ignored as a root mechanic of the yeah. game. Now, of course, some people are going to love this about Quacks. So personally, I really enjoy it. I think that balance is perfect in this game. I love that point where you're like, you know, the odds. And it's, you know, better than 50%. You're like, oh, I have a 60% chance to pull or not to pull. But I know that if I pull and I blow up, I'm not going to get to what uh, the next ruby. Or I want to buy this card that costs 12 and I'm sitting on 11. All of those factors. And you're like, and you look at it and you either, you know, yell out and yes, I got it. Or damn, I, I love that. And it can feel very rewarding when it works. And it can be very frustrating when it doesn't. But usually that frustration is more of an amusing moment. It's like, oh, I knew I pushed my luck. It's my fault. No one else made me do it unless you're doing an extra live stream. <laughs> um, I blew myself up. I'm, I'm the one that made the mistake. Yeah, and indeed, while the good game could have been punishing and left players hanging for that one step too far, it's just not. Yeah. And you stay in the game longer than you might expect, even making poor decisions. Yeah, it's one of those. That's another thing that people take into consideration. If you're the point leader, you can probably push your luck a little more than everyone else. 
And I have seen people get overconfident because they have a solid lead only to lose it. Now, moving more to the positive side, one of the best aspects of this game is the fact you aren't punished too severely. Your pot explode is not the end of the world. And that's what I expected when I read the rules and when I saw other people playing this game is it seemed horrible. Like my pot exploded, I get nothing, but it's not. While you may lose out on a bonus die roll, you then pick, do I want points or do I want purchasing? Another aspect that comes into play here too is that rat tail catch-up mechanic. I think this is really well done. I, I kind of surprised that people don't like this. All players but the leader get to thicken their pots at the start of each round. The only part of this that doesn't make sense is the fact that in the rules make this optional. Like, I, I, I guess it's optional for the people. They must have had play testers who were like, we don't like this. So, yeah, again, some people hate this mechanic. And there are some really almost bizarre discussions about it out there to be read. I'll, I'll, le I'll let you find, do that Googling <laughs> on your own. Yeah, you can discover that on your own. Uh, everything else about the game I love or like, um, rules are clear. It is really easy to teach. That is one, one aspect of this is the mechanics are tied very well into the theme. And, and just the idea of thickening potions and everything just makes sense, right? So when I'm teaching this game, I always talk about it. I'm like, you want to add cherry bombs because they make your pot bubble, which gets people's attention, right? You're going to get more points for a big bubbly pot. But you don't want it bubbling too much, it explodes. Or you know what? You can add rat tails to make your potion thicker. Like saying that just makes sense. And, and I find that people remember the rules for this game better than many other games I own. And people who even haven't played it for months remember this just because the theme is so well tied to those mechanics. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty hard to imagine not getting the basics down, even for someone completely new to the hobby gaming, quite quickly. Now, player boards are well-designed. Iconography here on the scoring track and the recipes all make sense. I honestly don't think I had to reference the rule book after our first game was done. Like, I don't think I've ever had to go back to it to check anything. Now, I will admit, we do use the almanac liberally to make sure we're getting the ingredients right. Now, the fact that many of the ingredients feature four different versions is another aspect I love about this game. What ingredients you use actually changes the feel of the game. Some are going to make thicker pots. Some are going to give you more randomness, and some are going to be less. If you want less randomness, here's a tip for you. Use the blue ingredient, the crow's head, that lets you pull multiple ingredients from your bag and put it back. Combine that with the red token that lets you save up chips between rounds and throw in the mandrake, the yellow, that gives you a chance to put back cherry bombs, and you've just reduced the randomness of this game by a huge factor. Yeah, of course, learning all these combos and mitigations is where the strategy and gameplay comes in outside the luck. Yes. So this is something you're deciding as a group for what ingredients to you. So it's not like you can, you can take advantage of it, but yes, noticing those combos is a big part of the strategy in this game. Another thing I do appreciate is the simultaneous play. I always love a game where you're invested all the time. While there can be some downtime if you finish pulling first or you blow up, most of the time everyone's playing inactive. And even if you're eliminated in this game, it's fun to watch other people antagonize over their pulls. Which leads me to another benefit of this game and its ability to draw a crowd. Now, this isn't going to matter for those of you who play at home with your regular group, but the push your luck nature of this game tends to get people excited and standing up and exclamations of joy and cries of frustration. This is a great public play event. We recently had a podcast episode where we talked about organizing public play events. One of the things you want to do is have something that will draw in people passing by or people not necessarily people playing other games but like people who are like oh what's going on over there right you want to do it quacks will do that for you fair warning though if there's people next to you playing an 18xx game they may not like you very much and you know, one of the first streams we ever rated as a channel was a play of quacks again just indicating mm -hmm. just how intriguing this game is out on the table so I, I think it's pretty obvious overall i dig this game a lot i think we both dig this game a lot um, well, I do have some very minor complaints, the bags and chips and the combination of both, um, and the push your luck thing may not be for everyone. This is a fantastic game. This is honestly one of the best games I played this year, with my only real regret being that it took till 2021 to be able to actually play this game. If you dig push your luck games, rush out and pick this up. Like, like you, don't, you don't need to play before you, you buy. As soon as you can, grab this game. Like, this is one of the best push your luck games I've ever played. It has replaced, it is now my top push your luck game, and it has displaced Dead Man Tell No, ah, Dead Man Tell No Tales, has fallen down below. 
because this is just such a great push of luck. Now, if you're into themes, if you're more about the themes of the games, if you like the theme of quack doctors brewing up snake oil, or dig games that tie that theme heavy to the mechanics, so there's a, a good binding of two, and don't mind a bit of luck being involved, you should also check this game out. Now, people who want a loud, raucous game that's a step above a party game, but still plays in under an hour, this could be perfect. I know we have had some great times combining this with some craft beers and New Year's parties, though the player count of only four players does mean it's not a perfect party game. Now, we don't have it, so we can't comment in detail, but the expansion does allow for a fifth player. There you go. Now, if you are a gamer who likes to be totally in control of your own destiny and dig games with perfect information where you can plan multiple turns ahead, Classic Quedlinburg is probably not for you. Oh, you never know. It might win you over. Now, I am guessing the majority of you listening or watching right now fall somewhere in the middle here. For you, I strongly recommend get, finding a way to try this game. Find a way to play before you buy or play a friend's copy, ask the local game store if they have a demo copy, try it out at a con. This game is designed so well, is so easy to teach, and can be so much fun, just like literal visceral fun of, do I blow up or not? It's going to appeal to a broader range of gamers than just people who like push your luck. And that's it for our review of Quacks of Quedlinburg. I invite you to check out Mo's written review of this expansion over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com.